Amen. I appreciate that, ladies. That was beautiful. Thank you so much. And I uh, appreciate these young ladies uh, giving their summer uh, to go around and represent the Lord Jesus Christ and, uh, of course, the college there as well. And uh, at the end of the service, um, we'll have some guys in the back that will have a couple offering plates. And if you'd like to um, just uh, give something to these young ladies, we'll have that available. Uh, obviously, uh, they're giving of their time. They could be working jobs uh, and raising money for the fall semester and things, but they're uh, wanting to serve the Lord and serve other churches. And uh, we appreciate them being with us. What a blessing that was, wasn't it? Uh, praise the Lord. Beautiful singing, uplifting, and uh, magnifying the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we sure appreciate uh, them being with us uh, here this morning. Take your Bibles this morning over the book of 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. We're continuing our series um, in 2 Timothy chapter 3. And this year our theme is taken from 2 Timothy chapter 3. In verse number 14, where Paul says, But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned, and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. And so uh, our desire is to continue in the things that the Word of God teaches us, and to uh, continue, as they've just sung, to uh, magnify the Lord Jesus Christ, and to move forward for the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And 2 Timothy chapter 3, and we'll begin reading in verse number 10, 2 Timothy chapter 3, let's begin reading in verse number 10. He says, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured, but out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all. And you get that word. All that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Father, I pray that you would just bless this morning. Thank you for the, the wonderful singing. Thank you for these young ladies just representing the Lord and um, Lord just singing uh, to lift up the name of Jesus. And Lord, I do pray that that is our desire, that our desire would be that our life would count for Jesus Christ in all that we do. And so, Father, I pray that you just work through the message this morning, speak to hearts. Uh, Lord, we pray for those watching via live stream, those here present with us. Lord, if any may not know Christ as their Savior, they'd put their faith and trust in you. Lord, for Christians, that we would have a greater desire to serve you and to do more for the cause of Jesus Christ. Lord, we know that you're coming soon, and so, Father, we ask that you would just work through us this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, last week we looked at the previous couple verses here and looked at uh, dangerous leaders and Paul uh, talks about Janus and Jambres and how these men uh, were dangerous leaders and how they resisted the truth and how dangerous leaders will mix just enough truth with their false teaching to uh, make people think that it is the truth. Uh, it's amazing when you go back, uh, Janus and Jambres, they, they performed several miracles just like Moses did, right? Uh, Moses and Aaron, God, God used them to perform miracles. Janus and Jambres, they, they performed a couple miracles, but there was a limit to what they could do. Aren't you glad there's a limit to what Satan can do? There's a limit there. He, he's, he's not all-powerful, and we thank God for that. We know that Jesus Christ, He is all-powerful. God the Father is all-powerful. All powerful. Um, and so even though they try to mix truth in with their false teaching, their desire is to try to lead people away from what is the truth. Yet when we truly examine what they say and how they live, you find that they actually, as Paul says, resist the truth. They, they deny the truth. They have corrupt minds. They're reprobate concerning the faith. In fact, the word reprobate there that he uses is the word fake. It's like counterfeit. They're not real. Uh, and, and so Paul is talking about how dangerous these false teachers are and in the last days how uh, not just the, the world is going to become more and more godless, the world is already godless, right? I mean, the world is already, uh, I mean, it's, it's crazy. But the, the warning that Paul is giving here in 2 Timothy is about how godless the church is going to become. And those who claim the name of Jesus Christ are going to become more and more godless and even following those who are bringing in false teaching. And so he's saying, hey, it's so important that you know the word of God 
And this is what we're going to be coming to here in verse number 10. He says, after talking about these false teachers, he says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience. He says, it's important that we understand, Paul says, we are to be a living example for the Lord Jesus Christ. These, these false teachers, they were an example, right? He, he points them out. He calls them out. If you go all the way back even to, uh, to chapter 1, he talks about those that were, um, that were opposing uh, the gospel there um, in verse number 15 about uh, uh, Phygelus and Hermogenes. And then there in chapter 2, he talks about others, uh, Hermanius and Philetus. And now he's talking about Janus. Hey, Paul was willing to call out those who weren't preaching the truth. He didn't have a problem. He said, these, these guys are not preaching the truth. They're, they're mixing in just a little bit of truth, but yet it's false teaching. And so you've got to know what is true and what's not. And it's important to live as examples. And this is what Paul is talking about. He says, thou hast fully known my doctrine. He says, Timothy, I want you to, to look at me and look at the example that I have lived, the example that I have given, and I want you to see the difference here. And this is what Paul is talking about in these next couple of verses about living examples. Not living as an example, but living examples. We are to be examples of what God desires for Christians. When a person looks at a Christian, they shouldn't have to wonder and say, I wonder if they're a Christian or not. They should be able to tell very clearly if we're that living example. And so notice, first of all, I'm just going to give you two things this morning. Notice, first of all, there is an example set. Paul says there's an example that is set. Notice he says, thou hast fully known. Paul is saying, Timothy, look at my life. You know me. You, you followed me. Examine my life. That idea of thou hast fully known means to examine. I mean, you, you take a fine tooth comb and you go through it. You get a magnifying glass. You examine my life, Timothy. You're going to see there's a difference between the way I have lived and what I have preached and what these others, how they are living and what they have preached. Examine my life, not just what I say. It's easy to say something. He says, don't just examine what I say, but how I have lived. Can I ask you a question this morning? What do people find when they examine your life? If you call yourself a Christian today, you say, I know I'm saved, then you are to be a living example. So what do people find if they were to examine your life? What do people know of you? Do they know you're a Christian? Let me ask you this. How do they know you're a Christian? Is it just because you say you are one? Or is it because of how you live your life and what you teach and the example that you're setting. It's interesting, Paul, when you go back and you study Paul's life, when he was standing before Agrippa back in Acts chapter 26, he he even tells Agrippa that, that his life has been basically an open book since he was a young man. As he's standing before Agrippa, he says this, my manner of life from my youth, which was at the first among mine own nation at Jerusalem, know all the Jews. He says, my life has been an open book from the very beginning. When I, was, when I was a Pharisee and I was training to be a Pharisee, everybody knew who I was. And then when I became a Pharisee, everybody knew who I was. They knew what I was doing. And he says, even now, I'm not hiding anything. I'm not trying to hide anything. I'm not trying to live two different lifestyles. He says, they know me. They know my life. Imagine the difference that people saw in his life from a young man to his life now. From a young man living for the Pharisees to now living for Jesus Christ. His life was evident. It was an example of how he was saying, Timothy, look, you examine my life. You look at that and see if there's anything there. And by the way, if there was anyone who would have known if Paul was fake, it would have been Timothy. If anybody would have known if Paul's life was fake, it would have been Timothy because Timothy was his son in the faith. Timothy was the one who went everywhere with Paul. I think it's interesting when Paul says this, he says, Timothy, thou hast fully known me in my life. He says, you've known everything about me. 
He says, Timothy, you know there's, there's nothing that's been fake about it. It's been real. It doesn't mean there hasn't been hard times. It doesn't mean there hasn't been difficulties that we've had to endure. It's interesting when he talks about the persecutions here in a few minutes, he goes all the way back to the beginning of his ministry when he met Timothy. All the way back to I- Iconium and, and Lystra. He says, you remember what happened there? He, he says how they, how they beat us and they stoned us and they, they took me outside the city and left me for dead. Timothy, you remember those things? He's not saying that his life was going to be easy, but he was living a life of an example. He was living a life that was real. Can I ask you a question again? What would those who are closest to you say about your life? No, not what your coworkers would say. Of course, we, we, that's important too, but what would those who are closest to you, because it's those who are the closest to you who are the ones who can really examine your life. Those who are closest to you are the ones who really examine your, wife, your life. If you're married, your husband, your wife, what would they say about your life? If they had to be completely honest and open, what would they have to say? Huh, this would scare us. What would our children say? Those of you that have children, what would they say about our life? Would they be able to say, like Paul, hey, go ahead, look at, look at my life, Timothy. You know from beginning to end, it's, it's an open book. You know some of us would be afraid to say that. We'd be afraid to say, hey, look at my life. Just go ahead, examine it from beginning to end. Hey, kids, look at my life. You, you tell me, what, what do you think about our life? Do you think that we are really being obedient to God? Do you think we really love Jesus and how we live our life? Or are we, are we faking it? This is what Paul is saying. You see, we are to be living examples, and Paul says he has set this example, and Paul says, unlike these fake religious leaders, he said, it's been real. It's not always been easy, but it's been real. And in our life, it's not always going to be easy, but it needs to be real. It's not always easy to follow Jesus. It's not always easy to follow what God says, but we need to be real about it. We need to be real. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, I have set an example. There's an example that's been set. He says, Timothy, you have fully known. You've been there from the time that I took you under my wing all the way through this ministry. There's an example set. But notice, secondly, there's an example lived. Notice he begins to explain all the things that Timothy has seen, all the things that Timothy can examine. He says, but thou hast fully known my doctrine Manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecution, afflictions. A lot of things he says here. He says, Timothy, you've, you've known how I've lived. Not only that I have set an example, but there is an example lived. He said, this is how I've lived my life. He says, you have fully known my doctrine. The word doctrine there has to do with our beliefs right? He had taught the true faith, the gospel of Jesus Christ. He had been true to the word of God. Even though there were others that tried to come along and tried to subvert the truth, Paul had stuck true to the word of God. Even though there were others that had tried to resist him, he says, no, I've stuck true. Even though it led to his imprisonment, and eventually in probably just maybe even a few days from writing this, it would lead to his death. He said, you know, I've stuck true. I've stuck to the truth of the word of God, my doctrine. Can I say, no matter how appealing a preacher or a church may be, if he does not preach the truth of God's word, we need to stay away from him. We need to stay away from him. In fact, Paul even says in Galatians chapter 1 and verse number 8 and 9, he says, though we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel than that we have preached unto you, let him be accursed. Paul says, if, even if an angel, now it's so interesting why he even brings that out. I mean, it'd be obvious if he said, if I preach another gospel, or if somebody else preaches another gospel, but he says, if an angel preaches another gospel, I wonder why he would say that. If an angel preaches another gospel, well, I wonder who the greatest fallen angel is. 
And I wonder what that fallen angel is going to try to do to subvert the truth. He's going to preach another gospel. He's going to try to to add just a little bit of it. He's not going to say don't. He's not going to deny that Jesus ever existed. He's not going to say don't believe in Jesus, but Jesus just isn't enough. I mean, you can believe in Jesus, but at the same time, you've also got to do all these different things to really be saved. You know, the devil's not going to deny religion. In fact, the devil uses religion. And this is why he says, hey, though we or an angel from heaven, isn't it interesting when you go back and look at all the different religions, how many of them started from an angel? How many religions started because an angel came down and, and told this to this person? And is it interesting that the angel and what they said goes against the word of God? And Paul says, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel unto you. And this is what he says, let him be accursed. And he says, just in case you missed it the first time, he repeats it in verse number nine again. Why? Because it's so important that our doctrine is right. It's so important that we stick to the truth of the word of God. By the way, before we can live, we better know what we believe. If we're going to live an example, we better know what we believe. You say, well, I don't want to be an example. It really doesn't matter whether you want to or not. You are. You say, well, I'm not the pastor. It doesn't matter. You are setting an example for someone. You are being an example for someone. Maybe it's just your own family. Maybe it's your children. Maybe it's a neighbor, whoever it is. You are being an example for someone. And so if you're going to be the right example, if we're going to live to be the example that God wants us to be, you better know what you believe. You better know what the Bible teaches. It saddens me to see Christians who have been in church for years, and yet they don't know what they believe. They're still being swayed by false teachers like Janus and Jambres. Friend, you've got to get in the book. You've got to get in the Word of God. You need to know what the Bible says and teaches. You need to base your life off of that, not what some man or his ideas are. You've got to get into the Word of God. You've got to know. Well, you say, well, I come to church so you can tell me what I'm supposed to believe. Heaven help you. You say, are you saying that you don't teach the Word of God? No, I I try my very best. But if that's all you're trusting in, you're just trusting in what a man says, you're not getting into the Word of God yourself, you're not studying it yourself, you don't know what you believe. And you're going to be swayed by every wind of doctrine that comes along. Some new doctrine comes along, oh, that sounds good. Some new doctrine comes along, oh, that sounds good. Some new doctrine, and you're just going back and forth you have no idea what you believe look can I tell you something I don't want you to believe something because First Baptist Church believes it I don't want you to believe something because Pastor Andrew believes it I want you to believe something because you found it in the Word of God that's where your beliefs ought to come from Paul says you have known my doctrine Timothy you can look you can, that brother brother just preached about uh, talked about verse number two what did he say Look back in 2 Timothy 2, 2. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses. He said, Timothy, you've heard what I've said. You, you know how I've lived. He said, I've set that example. I want to be that example that is living for Jesus Christ. What's your doctrine? What do you believe? Does it come from the Word of God or does it come from YouTube? Does it come from the Word of God or does it come from Facebook? Because if you're, you're getting your doctrine from Facebook and YouTube and all these other places, friend, you're getting it from the wrong place. You've got to get in the Word of God. The Word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword. Get in the Word of God. Know your Word. Know your doctrine. Thou hast fully known my doctrine. Notice what he says next. Manner of life. You see, before your manner of life can be right, your doctrine has to be right. He didn't say, Paul or Timothy, you've known the way I've lived, and then you've known my doctrine. No, he said, you've known what I've taught, what I've preached, what I believe, and you've seen how that has affected the way I live. You see, what you believe affects how you live your life. You don't believe this book, it's going to be evident in your life. You say, oh, no, pastor, I believe the word of God. 
there's a lot of Christians that are lying. There are a lot of Christians lying. They say they believe the word of God, but they're lying. They don't. You know how I know? They don't do what it says. You can't say you believe the word of God and then disobey what God says. Paul says, you've known my doctrine and you see it in my life. The manner of life, he says here. In my manner of life and how I've lived. It's not, again, it's not just enough to have right doctrine. We must also have the right lifestyle. Yeah, you can have the right doctrine, but if you don't live it, what good is the doctrine? You can say, well, I believe the word of God, but if you don't live it out, what good is it? It, it, it changes, it affects our life. By the way, can I say to live the life that God wants us to live, it takes his grace? It takes the grace of God to live it. That's why Paul, you know, he said, I, I, I need the grace of God. I need God's grace to live. Grace is not just for salvation, it's for living as well. We need the favor of God. We need the power of God. We need God working in our life to live the way he wants to live. Because humanly speaking, it's impossible in our flesh to live the way he wants us to live. It takes his grace. It takes following him. Paul says his life backed up the message that he preached. He didn't preach one way and then live another His message, the way he lived his life, backed up his message. Are, are we just, can I use the term Sunday Christians? On Sunday we go to church and on Sunday we do like Christian things, but then Monday through Saturday we just kind of live however we want? Then your, your manner of life is not backing up what you believe. If, if our manner of life is going to back up what we believe, it's got to be a consistent day in and day out lifestyle. We, we sometimes get this idea, we separate Christianity from our life. Where do you get that in Scripture? Where do you find that? Can I tell you where you find that? The world teaches that. The world teaches you to separate Christianity from your life. Oh, yeah, go to church, but then the rest of the week just live for the way you want to live. That's not what the Bible says. That's, that's why Paul was in prison, by the way, because his lifestyle was matching what he preached. He wasn't in prison because he did something wrong. He was in prison because he was preaching the word of God. Our lifestyle needs to show and exemplify what we believe. It's not just saying one thing and living another. No, it's living it day after day after day. You say, Pastor, I don't know if I can do that. You can't. You can't do that unless you have God's grace working through you. You can't do that unless you're going to God on a daily basis and say, God, I need your strength to live the way that you want me to live. Because if we don't, we're just going to live in our flesh and we're going to fail. We're going to fall. Paul says, Timothy, you've known my doctrine. You've known my manner of life. Timothy, you've known my purpose. I wish we could take so much more time on these things. What was Paul's purpose? Think about it. What was Paul's purpose? Oh, he was an apostle. Well, that's what his, kind of what we could say maybe his job was. That wasn't his purpose. What was Paul's purpose? Can I tell you this morning, Paul's purpose is the same purpose that God has for you? You say, well, I'm not an apostle. That's right, you're not an apostle, and neither am I. That's not what our, our purpose is. What was Paul's purpose? His purpose was to glorify God in all that he did in his life. To bring glory to God in everything. He wanted to do God's will and to finish the work that God gave him to do. That was his purpose. To, to glorify God. Not just on Sunday. Not just on Sunday when we sing some hymns, No, not one, Jesus saves Okay, I glorified God. Well, that's wonderful. Praise God for that. But what about tomorrow? Are you going to glorify God tomorrow? Are you going to glorify God on Monday at work? Oh, it's Monday. Somehow we think Monday we don't have to glorify God. <laughs> right? 
It's Monday. That's the day we don't have to glorify God. No, that's the day we ought to glorify God. We were just at church on Sunday. We were just worshiping him, and then all of a sudden the next day, because I'm at work now, it's off limits. I don't have to glorify God. Wait a minute. That's, that's not what he's saying. What about Tuesday? Going to glorify God Tuesday? And Wednesday? And Thursday? And Friday? And Saturday? You see, it's not just to be a one day a week thing. No, Paul's purpose was to glorify God in all that he did. Everything that he did, he wanted to bring glory and honor to God. Look, Paul was not perfect. Don't, don't get me wrong, right? The only person you're going to find that was ever perfect in this book is Jesus Christ. He's the only one. Paul wasn't perfect. Moses wasn't perfect. David wasn't perfect. You're not perfect. I'm not perfect. No, nobody's perfect. But we can still glorify God in what we do and how we live. And this is what Paul is saying, Timothy, you've known my doctrine, you've known my manner of life, you've known my purpose, and everything points to one person, and that's Jesus Christ. What is our purpose? What is your purpose? Well, my purpose is to make money. Well, that might be what you're doing, but that's not your purpose. Well, my purpose is to, you know, uh, know, I'm going to spoil those grandkids when I get them. Well, that's probably a great thing. That's not your purpose. It's not your purpose. If you're a Christian here this morning, you have one purpose, and that's to glorify God in everything you do. You say, but I'm not the preacher. Again, where where are we we getting these ideas from? I'm not the missionary. I'm not the singing group. You know, I'm not. uh, Those are the people that are supposed to glorify God. Wait a minute. Are you a Christian? Did you, have you accepted Jesus Christ as your Savior? Look, now I know there's a lot of people that call themselves Christians that are not. There are a lot of people that think, well, you know, I got baptized and so that makes me a Christian. Friend, I'm sorry, it doesn't. Well, I go to church and I'm a member of a church. Friend, there's a lot of members of churches that are burning in hell today. Just because you're a member of a church doesn't mean you're saved. Joining a church doesn't forgive your sins. Trying to keep the Ten Commandments isn't going to get you to heaven. There's only one way and that's through Jesus Christ. That's why Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. There's only one way, and that's through Jesus Christ. And then when we come to him by faith, and we believe that he is the only way, and we're able to put our faith and trust in him, then he says, hey, I'm going to make you a new creature. Now you have a new purpose in life. The old purpose of life was self. The new purpose is Christ. The old purpose was just do what I want to do and live how I want to do. Now the new purpose is glorify God in all that I do. You see, we have a purpose now. Our purpose is to glorify God. Paul says, Timothy, you've known. You've known me. You know my doctrine. You know my manner of life. You know my purpose. Now again, what would we do? What would be said of us if we said, hey, I want you to examine my doctrine? I want you to examine what I believe. See if it lines up with Scripture. I want you to examine my manner of life. I want you to examine how I live. <laughs> I just thought of something. <laughs> what? How, how would we live differently, right? And, and please, don't, I'm, not, I'm not trying to lift up anybody here this morning. But how, how do you think, would you... Would you talk the same way at work if your pastor was standing right there? Would you talk the same way? Would you, would you listen to the same things that you listen to if your pastor was standing right there? Then why do we? Who am I? I'm nobody. Do you not understand that Jesus is standing there? Jesus hears it all. Jesus knows what you're saying. Jesus knows what you're thinking. Jesus knows how you're responding. And Jesus knows through it all we're not glorifying him. What if this week we just, we just decided, you know what, this week I'm going sh- to make an effort. This week, every day, I want to glorify God. Every day, I'm going to glorify God. Every morning, I'm going to wake up, and I'm going to say, God, today, I want to glorify you. And you know what's going to happen? The devil's going to fight you. There's no doubt about it. The devil's going to fight you. 
But you say, God, today, every, throughout this day, Lord, I just want to glorify you in all that I do. God, I'm going to need your help with this. <laughs> oh, yeah. God, I'm going to need your help. But God, I want to glorify you today and Monday. Monday is, I don't know why we think it's the worst day, because maybe it's the, worst, the first day of the work week or whatever. God, on the, the worst day that people think of, of the week, I want to glorify you today. And when I go to work, and, and I know, I know when I go to work, that person's going to be there. And they just rub me the wrong way. But God, I want to glorify you. And so God, would you help me when that person is there to have the right attitude toward them? And when they say the wrong thing, would you help me to glorify you and how I respond? You say, Pastor, you're asking a lot. No, I'm just asking what God says. I'm just asking what God says. This is our purpose, right? Some of you college students, right? I know everybody glorifies God in college, right? I went to Crown, I know. I was one of those that didn't, by the way. Doesn't matter if you're a college student, doesn't matter if you're a young person in school, friends, sports, work, neighborhood. Are you going to fulfill God's purpose for your life? To glorify Him and what He wants you to do? Paul says, you know me, Timothy. You can look at my life. You know my doctrine. You know my manner of life. You know my, my purpose, my faith. He says, you know my faith. The, 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 I, I live by faith. If anybody lived by faith, I believe it was the Apostle Paul. I mean, he didn't, he didn't have a job. He didn't really know where his, his next meal was going to come from. Many times it was from the, uh, the, the gifts of churches and others that helped him along the way. Many times it was by making a tent or something like that. And he lived by faith. He trusted God to meet his needs. Long-suffering. I would say Paul was probably long-suffering. He was willing to suffer for right. How many times was he put in jail? How many times was he beaten? Not only with rods, rods, but with the cat of nine tails. He tells us five times he's beaten with the cat of nine tails. Three times he was beaten with rods. Think about all the time he was put in prison. I'd say he was long-suffering. And we can't get along with one person at work. He says, you know, my long-suffering, my charity, charity expressing grace to others, showing the love of Christ to those around us. Hey, that's what he says we're supposed to do. He says, Timothy, you know. Hey, not everybody was nice to me, but yet I still tried to show grace to them. I still tried to love them. Patience, he endured. He didn't quit. He didn't quit. Can I tell you, it probably would have been easy for Paul to quit. And if he would have quit, I don't think anybody would have blamed him. I mean, beaten with cat of nine tails five times, I think maybe after the first two, we'd have said, hey, Paul, if you, if you want to pull out, man, I, I think you're okay. Beaten with rods three times? You know, Paul, if, you know, if nobody's going to think bad if you just step down. All the times he was in prison, but he didn't quit. We quit at the drop of a hat. God doesn't answer our prayer right away the way that we want it to be answered. We just, we quit on God. Somebody, somebody looks at us the wrong way, we quit on God. Somebody doesn't shake our hand at church, we quit on God. That's, that's patience, isn't it? That's endurance. And we've lost that in Christianity today. We've lost it. But Paul says, hey, I was willing to be patient. I endured the persecutions, the afflictions, all these things that Paul went through, even being stoned, left for dead. Paul said, I went through all of those things. Why? For himself? No. For Christ. And this is what he says. Notice what he says. But out of them all, verse, at the end of verse number 11, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Yet through it all, everything that he went through, Paul says, hey, I know God was right there with me. And he delivered me through the 
cat of nine tails. Now, I didn't say he delivered me from the cat of nine tails. He delivered me through the cat of nine tails. He didn't deliver me from the rods. He delivered me through the rods. He didn't deliver me from the stoning. He delivered me through the stoning. He didn't deliver me from imprisonment. He delivered me through imprisonment. You see, we get this idea. We have a problem. We pray. We ask God to take it away. And if God doesn't, we think God hasn't delivered. Wait a minute. Is he trying to deliver you from it or is he trying to deliver you through it? There's a big difference. You see, if he's able to deliver us through it, you know what that that's going to do to our faith? It's going to increase our faith. You see, if we just are delivered from our problems, guess what's never going to grow? Our faith is never going to grow. We're never going to be able to really trust God if he just delivers us from all of our problems. If he's just this magic genie, as soon as a problem comes, God, take it away, and poof, it's gone. Well, that's not going to help our faith. But if he says, hey, I'm not going to take it away, but I'll walk through it with you. And I can deliver you through it. Oh, can I tell you something? We're going to learn to trust him a whole lot more. That's what he says. But out of them all, the Lord delivered me. I love what Paul says in Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 15, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God without rebuke in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. You understand, he says, God's desire is for you and I as Christians to shine as lights, to shine as lights in the midst of a crooked and perverse world. Are we not in a crooked and perverse world? I would say we are. Yet he says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to shine as a light. I want you to glorify me. I want you to let people see your life. Set an example. Be an example that people can look and see, hey, this is what they believe, and because of what they believe, this is how they live. We can see it. It's evident. But many Christians, if people were to examine our life, would they truly be able to tell that we're a Christian? By what we believe, you see, what we believe affects how we behave. If we're not believing what God says, we're not going to behave the way God says. We're not going to glorify God. Our purpose is going to be wrong. Paul says, hey, Timothy, you've seen me as an example. Now, Timothy, you do the same thing. You be that example for others to follow. You set the example. You be a living example. And for you and I as Christians, you know what we need to be? We need to be a living example for others to follow. We need to be a living example that others can say, hey, I, I see their life. No, they're not perfect, but I see what they believe, and they stick to what they believe, and it affects how they live their life. And even through problems and even through difficulties and even through with that person at work that just really gets on their nerves, they just always seem to glorify God through it all. I tell you, that's what God's desire is. That's the example that he wants us to set, not only for Christians, but so that the world can see there is light. The world can see there is hope. It's not in the church. It's not in religion. It's in Jesus Christ. Father, I pray that you'd help us, Lord. Lord, to really understand how important it is to be a living example. As Paul told Timothy, Lord, Look at my life, Timothy. Look how I've lived. Examine it. Lord, I'm afraid for many Christians, many of us, we would not want someone to examine our life. Our doctrine, we're not really sure what we believe. We're not sure why we believe it. Our manner of life, oh, it doesn't line up with Scripture. Our purpose, we're not glorifying God. Lord, all these different things, our faith, our long-suffering, our charity, our patience, Lord, persecution, all these different things. Lord, I pray you to help us in this. We need your help to be the right example in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation that we could shine as lights for Jesus Christ. I wonder with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, no one looking about this morning, 
Friend, maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not even sure if I'm saved. You said something about if, if you're a member of a church that you're not saved, or if, you're, if you just got baptized, you're not saved, or if you're trying to keep the Ten Commandments, you're not saved. And, Pastor, I, that's what I thought helped to save me. I thought if I was baptized or a member of a church or trying to keep the Ten Commandments, that that's, that's how I would get to heaven. Pastor, you're saying that Jesus is the only way? Yes, friend, that's right. Jesus is the only way. There is no other way. You say, Pastor, I'd, li- I'd like to know more about that. I'd like to know more about what the Bible says and how I can know that I'm saved. That I can know my sins are forgiven and that I have peace with God. If you're here this morning, you say, Pastor, that's me. No, nope, friend, nobody else is looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you in any way, but I would like to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up, put it right back down? Nobody else is looking about. Just slip it up, put it right back down. Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not going to come to you. I'm not going to call you out. But I just want to pray for you this morning. Just slip it up, put it right back down. Pastor, pray for me. I'm not sure if I'm saved. I'm not sure if I died right now. I'm not sure if I would go to heaven. Pastor, would you pray for me? Just slip it up, put it right back down. My prayer can't save you, but I do want to pray for you this morning. And Christian, can I ask you this morning, what would happen if somebody were to examine your life, your doctrine? Do you know what you believe? Are you in the Word? Would you be able to be swayed by some new doctrine that comes along? What about your manner of life? Does it back up what you believe? What about your purpose? Are you glorifying God in your life? Not just on Sunday, but what about Monday? What about this week? Why don't you maybe take that challenge and say, this week I want to try to glorify God every day. I'm going to start today. When I leave church, I'm going to make sure today I'm glorifying God. Tomorrow, in the morning, when I wake up, I'm going to ask God to help me to glorify Him today. And Tuesday, I'm going to wake up and say, God, I want to help, help me to glorify you today. And Wednesday and Thursday and Friday, and see the difference that it makes in your life when we're living for His purpose instead of living for our purpose. Lord, I pray you'd bless the invitation. Lord, continue to speak to hearts. May we be yielded and obedient to what you'd have for us, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. With our heads bowed, our eyes closed, we're just going to stand quietly to our feet this, this morning. The piano's just going to begin playing softly. Friend, maybe there's something that God spoke to your heart about this morning. Maybe you need to come and pray at the altar. Maybe right there in your seat. Are you glorifying God every day of your life? Is it just a Sunday thing? What about tomorrow? purpose. Live